Good afternoon, participants. Um, welcome to the second session that uh, we are having uh, during this uh, second uh, mediation symposium. Uh, this afternoon, we will be looking at uh, uh, the issue of positioning policy and practice. And uh, we have our speakers with us who will be guiding us uh, through the session. As we normally do, uh, we will uh, begin with the national anthem. And uh, the words of the national anthem are just uh, on the screen. We can be able to, in just a minute, Okay, we can be able to say the words of the national anthem uh, together to begin. O oh God of all creation, bless this our land and nation. Justice be our shield and defender. May we dwell in peace. May we dwell in unity, peace and liberty. Plenty be found within our borders. Okay. Um, for this uh, particular session, uh, we will be taken through by uh, uh, Wangari and uh, welcome, Wangari, please go on. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah, and good afternoon, everybody. It is a joy and a delight for us to be here together. Welcome, uh, Shanti. Uh, Abraham from the Malaysia, we are delighted to have you uh, on the call with us. Uh, well, welcome, Honorable Kandagor. It's always um, a joy and a delight that you do spend time with your people, uh, your mediators, mm -hmm. and uh, we are elated that um, you consider us uh, worthy to uh, spend time with us and also to support our, uh, the growth uh, that uh, we are on as uh, the Wasiliana Hub Mediators uh, mm -hmm. uh, community and also the wider growing community um, of mediators. Um, Alex Moneki, it is um, uh, very exciting that uh, you have been able to now spend time with us today. And uh, most of all, because this is now the virtual space that we are having the opportunity to uh, do it, to engage um, on with you. So allow me to introduce also our uh, young mediators for today. That is uh, Rashid Mwiza and Lily Minor. And uh, this being the month of June being the Young Mediators Month, uh, it is uh, also very exciting for us that uh, we have the Young Mediators as the ones who are on the driver's seat uh, for each of the sessions that we are hosting today. So Lily Minor and uh, Rashid Guiza, who will be going first, we are excited mm -hmm. to be with you. And at the same time, we would like to thank you for uh, being with us. Our uh, message and uh, for today is uh, which way for Kenya with regard to mediation on positioning, policy, and practice. So without uh, further ado, allow me to kindly invite Lily Miner for her opening um, commentary. Lily Miner, welcome. Um, thank you so much, Wangari, for giving me this opportunity. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so glad and happy to be part of this discussion this afternoon. And we are all learning. As you've heard, I'm a young mediator, mentee. Mm -hmm. So I've been in the process of being mentored for the past one year or so. And I'm still learning and I'm looking forward to learning more from everyone in today's discussion. So on today's topic, um, about which way for Kenya when it comes to our positioning policy and practice. Um, when I saw this uh, heading, uh, what came to my mind was uh, on positioning was uh, the current laws that we have that actually uh, allow us to govern, uh, to practice mediation. And of course, Article 48 of the Constitution on access to justice comes to mind first. And of course, Article 159 and Section 59A to D of the Civil Procedure Act 2010. Now, having this in mind, uh, even as we look at uh, what the future holds for mediation, I think um, for mediation, we should ensure that it is not exposed to 
the inefficiencies of the court process. And uh, with this, I'm referring to of the court process, such as the delays and the bureaucracy that is usually uh, a hectic thing in the court, in the judicial process. And with this, I'm referring to court annexed mediation. And I'm so glad that we have Honorable Kendagor with us this afternoon. And pro probably she's going to shed some more light uh, about the quarter next mediation because I keep asking myself, uh, doesn't quarter next mediation take away the voluntariness of the, I hope I say that right, voluntariness um, of the process that's affecting, that's negatively affecting the entire mediation process. So I hope there's some more light that is going to be shed on that. And um, when it comes to Kenya's policy on mediation, um, for me, I think we tend to take mediation as an alternative, an alternative uh, mechanism to the, to the um, judicial process. And um, I once saw in Karyukimwigwa's article uh, that he actually says mediation is a standalone form of uh, dispute resolution. And he refers to it as a standalone because it has been there uh, since time immemorial because it was being practiced by uh, elders in communities, just that they didn't call it mediation, probably negotiations, assisted negotiations, but they didn't call it um, mediation. But since it's been there, um, it's not an alien concept, so we can't really call it an alternative. It has been there and we should actually uphold it as one. So if it is a standalone form of dispute resolution, um, we should also look at the aspect of, is it uh, at the end of it, is it a resolution or a settlement? Because uh, I tend to believe that there's actually a big difference between the two, uh, a resolution and a settlement, because when it comes to a resolution, uh, dispute resolution results to an outcome that is based on um, mutual problem sharing and solving of the, of the disputes at hand, while a settlement kind of involves a compromise because it's an, sort of an agreement over the issues of the conflict which somehow involves a compromise, a party has to uh, forego something, to get something, and so forth. So that is what I thought about Kenya's policy, that we actually uh, refer to mediation as an alternative rather than an actual um, standalone mechanism of dispute resolution. So with the difference between resolution and settlement, it got me thinking, and probably this may form part of our discussion this afternoon, I uh, should we be referring to the agreements that we have as settlement dispute, settlement agreements or dispute resolution agreements? I don't know, that is just a, a thought, so maybe we can discuss about that. And um, about the mediation practice in Kenya, I don't know how many of us are actually aware that there's a, a mediation bill 2020 in parliament that was actually tabled in June this year. And it is a very interesting legislation in my opinion, because as much as its intention is uh, very welcome and mediators will have a reason to smile about uh, because nobody can start uh, pinning us down and telling us uh, we don't even have a law that provides for ABCD, you know. Um, it, some of the provisions of, of the bill, um, and let me refer to one that I saw, uh, that is section six of the bill. It talks about a mediation committee which is appointed by the AG. Now, in this committee, which constitutes of nine members, there is no member that is an informal mediator. 
and I'm talking about uh, informal mediators, I'm referring to people like the chiefs who are not trained, like most of us, they don't have that formal training of mediation. So yet we all know that they are the ones who actually do most of the mediation before it even gets to a professional mediator. So what is their place in this whole uh, process? So they are not there and I'm not aware if maybe uh, we'll be informed by uh, Honorable Kendagor if there's actually any member or an informal mediator who is a member of the existing accreditation committee um, in, 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 in the country at the moment. So I think that is one of the things that um, I'm looking at. Um, it is also interesting that it's the functions of the committee among the functions, it doesn't talk about creating awareness about mediation. It only talks about promoting mediation as a mechanism of dispute resolution. So uh, that is also one thing to look at if we are thinking about the future of practice, seeing that there's a bill in parliament that is about to be enacted to govern mediation. Uh, the bill also talks about uh, recognition and enforcement of settlement agreements. And when I saw this, what came to mind was what we were discussing in um, our previous webinar about the Singapore Convention on, on Mediation. So probably this is a, a way that will open the door for, for that convention to be adopted in our country. Uh, also to note there are provisions about offenses and punishment of mediators probably if we get time we can all go through the bill and just be aware of what lies ahead for us as mediators mm. so with this um just something that i remembered um about the laws that we have uh i don't know i i was aware that there were pilots uh, mediation pilot uh, rules. I don't know if they are the same as the mediation rules 2015 uh, that were drafted by the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration. Perhaps Mr. Mwaniki uh, will do us the honors to enlighten us on whether those rules are still in force or what is currently being used as the rules governing mediation so that Moving forward in practice, we know what, what we have in place. So with these few remarks, um, I believe that mediation is, the informality of mediation makes it more flexible and expeditious. And I don't know whether moving forward with the bill that it will make it um, complex and maybe people feeling that uh, the flexibility is being taken away um, I don't know, probably through our discussion this afternoon, we'll leave the meeting uh, having an answer to this. So that is what I had in mind about today's discussion. So probably moving forward uh, with the other panelists and probably Rashid also, will also, they'll also enlighten us more as we move forward. Thank you so much, Wangari. Thank you, everyone. I'm looking forward to an interactive session. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lily, for uh, your very insightful uh, introduction. I would like to take this opportunity to invite Rashid. Rashid Mbuiza is a young mediator. Rashid, welcome. Yes, Rashid is one of our young mediators and uh, he's joining us from Mombasa. He will be giving us his uh, comments on the topic for today, which is uh, Which Way for Kenya on the June 25th. Thank Rashid, welcome. Thank you very much, Wangari. Now, much has been talked by my fellow young mediator, Lily Maina. So what I'm going to talk about largely will be on the issues of practice as a mediator, as a young mediator so far with my experience, what have I seen 
are the challenges in practicing mediation in Kenya at the moment. Now, I am a certified professional mediator. I am also a quota next mediator. And with those, I, I, I being a secondary career to me, my first, uh, my, my, my primary profession uh, being a lawyer, I, I did not find satisfaction in just litigation or rather in dispute resolution through the secular system. So I developed an interest in mediation through uh, uh, some, uh, some inspiration or um, a mentor who is a writer from Kwale. And with that interest, I felt I would serve better in the, in the legal field if I learned more about alternative dispute resolution. So through Cotanext mediation and, uh, and through my, my experience in the community, I have managed to understand really what is the purpose of a mediator uh, uh, to himself or to themselves and to the community. I, I view mediation as more rewarding to the community more than uh, to the person myself. So in a way, it is a way of living for others. Uh, I'm part of a community-based organization in Kuala County, which is called the Organization for Creative Leadership, uh, where we deal with many things. And among them is uh, conflict competence through informal mediation workshops. And it's something that we just began uh, last year we are yet to get further in that. Now, with further enthusiasm, because I'm young, I, I have a challenge of, of getting mentors who are established mediators, or rather who, people who have decided to look at mediation as a profession that can stand on its own without having been a legal, uh, a legal uh, professional or in any other field that can put them in a position where they can deliver without being, having something else that they're doing. So in that position, because I, I have no mentorship, I, 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 I went ahead and opened a business name and uh, I am currently uh, managing uh, the Win-Win Chamber, which I formed as a consultancy for mediation. It is still a fresh uh, business, rather a practice, so I'm looking forward to success in it. And um, what I can say is there are many challenges that a young mediator will go through in practice. Now, the challenge is how to keep up with the, with the current situations that keep emerging, yet we do not have the, the expertise to deal with the basic things first. The basic things I mean is how do you develop your own private practice that I have found to be a challenge. Despite having opened a business name, I'm, I'm struggling to, 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 to practice professionally. I have done several pro bono cases for, to improve my, my experience and also to give back to the community through the, the community-based organization and through the consultancy. But now I feel it is time also to get professionally to get professional enough to make a living out of mediation, which is where most young mediators or uh, most mediators that are learning want to be. So my challenge has been how to keep up uh, with the emerging trends uh, because I do not have a, a good a mentor at the moment. I'm looking forward maybe after this session, I could be mentored or rather one uh, senior mediator might uh, volunteer themselves to be my mentor for the rest of their lives because I always need someone who will keep me sane with, with what I am doing. And um, I can say there is one thing uh, that needs to be, that, to be worked on when it comes to practice and that is creating awareness to the communities. I've discovered that through the Organization for Creative Leadership, CBO, if we can create more awareness, we can have the impact of having more people in the community being knowledgeable about, about, uh, the, that, about the alternative dispute resolution mechanism that exists, mediation being one. And 
the big question that I would like to, to, to pose to senior mediators is how do we create this awareness? Yes, we want to make a living or rather we want to, to establish ourselves as professional mediators, but how do we create this awareness? Because there, there are challenges that, can be, uh, that need to be faced and, and to be discussed by all of us in this uh, mediation field. So one of the things that I've been doing to fight these challenges is to create a social media platform or a social media presence for myself. I have several, uh, face, uh, I have several uh, accounts in Facebook and Instagram. Uh, one, uh, each, in, each, uh, in each field, I have a personal account and uh, an account for the consultancy. And we also, as a community-based organization, we also have accounts. In that way, we are able to spread awareness about mediation. Another thing we have discovered is we need alliances as mediators in practice uh, to, with fellow mediators and with the court users committee. We need, we need uh, friends, we need connections with people who, are, who already are somewhere uh, with, the, with the practice of mediation to expose us to opportunities to help us see the way forward and also to assist each other on how we can develop a mediation culture and slowly by slowly reduce the culture of litigation because it is very uh, time consuming. It affects relationships down here at the, at the grassroots level and it also uh, reduces uh, mediation reduces the backlog of cases in courts, which we have experienced and witnessed. One of the challenges, personally, in practice, I found has been opening an office. As a young mediator, who, who, who I believe I am destined for success, there are resources that I need. And one of those resources has been establishing myself with, a, with, a, with an independent office space. Now, that being a challenge, I am a freelancing mediator. I, 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 th I thought because as an advocate, if I was an advocate, I meant to, to get my, post, my postgraduate diploma from, KS, from the Kenya School of Law. But now, if I were an advocate already, I would have somewhere I work, like an office that is where, like where I am now, I'm holding over. That is an office, it's somebody's office. But for those who do not have an office, they usually freelance. So as a mediator, I put myself in the shoes of a freelancing advocate and said, I'm also a freelancing mediator. So that way I'm accessible to all clients in, in Kwale, in Mombasa, and also in the neighboring counties of Kilifi. So what I would encourage fellow young mediators is to develop an enthusiasm that will not be extinguished by any challenge and to never give up, to always attend virtual meetings that will always keep you sane. For instance, what we are having now at Wasiliana Hub, it's a very nice experience. We are able to keep tabs with what is happening in other areas around Kenya, and globally. And I look forward to being part of the future of mediation locally and globally. In case there is any question at this level, then I will be ready to answer any questions and I encourage people to, to ask questions using the chat, the chat facility and also to engage with me when they, when they want. I like to share. So regarding the community aspects of mediation, feel free to interact with me and also how to establish a mediation consultancy. I'll be ready to, to assist and also to be assisted if you have any more, more knowledge you would wish to share. Back to you, Ms. Wangari. Thank you very much, Rashid. I really must say that I acknowledge you and Lily, one, for your stepping up, your boldness. 
uh, ever since this uh, period of COVID and actually even from last year, because that is when we started engaging with yourself, we have seen uh, the two of you together also with uh, the other young mediators who are on the, the symposium with us, um, Amanda Maseno and also uh, Constance Terry, uh, together with other peers also who are not on the call, Mohamed Said, who are not um, on the symposium schedule, Mohamed Said. We've seen yourselves stepping up and really just taking on and more so even supporting us in our in getting ourselves more digital than we probably have the capacity. So I really thank you for that and also for your introductory um, commentary. I noticed that Lily has uh, talked about um, uh, on uh, aspects of policy and for yourself, you, Rashid, you have been straight up with regard to the aspect of mentorship. So we are looking forward to hear what the good is that uh, uh, our next speaker, who is uh, Alex Maneki from the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration, the good is that he has, which may probably answer into that. And also we're looking forward to hearing from uh, Honorable Kendagor, who will be speaking in right after um, Alex Maneki. Alex Maneki, welcome to the call. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Angari, for Hi. your kind invitation. Well, and thank uh, you for joining us. All right, then. And I'm happy to be here today to share some insights and more particularly on some of the things we do at the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration. I made a deliberate uh, move to wear one of our branded shirts of the Nairobi Center uh, since that's currently my home. And I'm happy to interact with um, all of you. I'm uh, glad to have heard what Lily and Rashid have spoken about. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be in, one, in my presentation, I'll of course refer to some of the questions they raised as I focus on what my agenda for the day is. And I'll go straight to the point. And having, you know, acknowledging that I'm speaking to mediators and uh, practitioners in ADR, I am certain that you have, in one way or the other, heard about the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration and what it is that we do. We are a statutory body established by an act of parliament. And um, this is Act number 26 of 2013, which was enacted um, uh, in 2013. And one of the things we do at the center is that we administer uh, disputes, both arbitration and mediation. And of course, our focus today being mediation, I would be happy to speak about how we get mediators on our panel. Uh, the process of, we call it panel listing. And um, the process begins obviously by an applicant uh, getting our, uh, no, downloading our application form or filling the application form uh, through the SA website. And uh, allow me to take what, just two minutes to go through that form. And it's a very basic and self uh, explanatory form. It starts with basically your description, who it is that you are. Um, particulars of your, of your, you know, I mean, your name, your nationality, you have multiple nationalities and, and so on. And the name of a farm, if applicable, your address and, um, and your, basically your contact details. Oh, after filling that form, uh, that bit, the second bit is on education. One of the things that the center looks at is at the level of academic qualification. And this, we have a, start, a panel set a standard which requires that applicants to have a minimum of a degree from a, a recognized university. Any degree, not necessarily a legal degree or it's any degree as a minimum. And secondly, uh, these uh, applicants should be accredited, should be a certified mediator, uh, accredited as such by a registered or recognized mediation training institution. And uh, on a minimum basis that the person should have at least completed a mediator training course of not less than 40 hours and be a member of, uh, uh, a current member in good standing of a registered or a recognized professional body. This is basically now on the educational qualifications. And uh, if you look at the application form, it tells you what you need to attach for us to process once we receive the form on the other end. Once you've, um, you know, once you filled in the, on the bit of the education, the next bit, which is always very important, is the mediation experience. The center is looking to bring people on board in their panel, people who have some sort of experience. And uh, I am privy to what Rashid said, uh, being a young mediator without much of experience, 
and I'll be speaking to, to that uh, in, in a short while. So the next bit in the application form is, uh, as I've just said, is mediation experience. We want to see what have you done, what is your area of strength, have you done commercial mediation, construction, investor state, family, uh, and whatnot. And what was your role? Was you, are you a mediator or a co-mediator or a council or an agent? And that all that information is uh, contained in the application form. The next bit is to provide a brief outline of basically the disputes you've handled. Of course, uh, noting to protect a very key aspect of confidentiality, not revealing the details of the parties. We just really want to know or focus on what issues are these that uh, you handled in your mediation. The center does this because they don't know where to place you. Are you, you know, focused on construction and mediations? No, are you focused on family and, you know, just to categorize where you would then, um, you know, fall in the panel. The, the next thing, of course, is the years you've acted as a mediator, uh, whether you're certified or credit mediator. And the last thing is whether mediation is your primary or full-time practice. Towards the end of the form, there's a declaration. Basically, you're declaring that, you know, you provided a declaration that the information provided is, is, is complete and accurate. And of course, it's not a false statement to which may disqualify the application. And the very last bit, which again is very important, is uh, the undertaking. You have to sign an undertaking that if you, are, if you come to the NCIA panel, you will then be bound by the terms and conditions applicable to the NCIA mediator panel status and to comply with the mediator panel status standards. And we also do have a code of conduct for mediators. So you declare and say that you were going to abide by, by, by that. One of, one of the attachments that we would have to accompany your, your application is a referee of two, uh, or rather a recommendation letter by two referees who attest to your mediation experience. This uh, we always you know, would want to have just someone who recommends and says, I know Rashid, I know Lily, they are mediators, and if they're given a chance, they would you know, prove themselves. So that's basically uh, the details contained in the application form. This form is available on our website, uh, available at the center's offices. And uh, that's pretty much what, once the application is, is filled and it's complete, we receive it and the secretary processes that application to just uh, do a checklist on completeness that you've attached or that is required. And once uh, that is done, we forward the same to uh, a, a committee of the board. The committee is called the Legal and Legislative and Accreditation Committee. The committee um, reviews the application and makes a recommendation to the full board for either approval or you know, if the application is complete and the committee of the board is satisfied that you are qualified to, to be on the panel, it's referred to the board for ratification. Once that is done, we then uh, write back to the applicants and inform them of the decision of the board. There's a very key uh, aspect that Wangari has been speaking about uh, in recently. Uh, and this is on the fees. How much would you then need to, to get on the panel? We have a very um, friendly rate for, for panel listing and the application fee. So our panel is, mediation panel is divided into two, two aspects. There's the domestic mediation panel and the international mediation panel. So uh, on the domestic mediation panel, this is for Kenyans and East African community states, the ESC. The application fee is Kenyan shillings 2000, all right? And for any other nationality, it's a hundred US dollar. Once your application, once the application fee accompanies your application, or rather, before you submit this to the board, this is an amount that must have been paid to the center to complete your application. And once this goes to the board, if the board approves your application, there are two fees that are payable thereafter. One is a registration fee for you to now be on the panel and an annual fee. The registration fee for Kenyans and East African community states, again, is a, a, a figure of 10,000 shillings, and the annual fee is 10,000 shillings for domestic. And this is for Kenyans and the East African communities. And therefore, for other nationalities, the registration fee is 500 US dollars, 
and other nationalities for annual fee again, 300 US dollars. So technically this is what you would require for you to, to get on the panel. There's a question that, um, and allow me Wangari to speak to something Lily uh, spoke about, on um, the place for these informal mediators. We do have, in uh, consideration for the applications received to us, a consideration of, uh, we actually call it, um, so we call it experience qualified. And this is for applicants who may not possess, those are the qualifications that I spoke about, but whose qualification is assessed by the center as demonstrating a level of competence uh, by reference to them having practiced mediation um, you know, before. And this applies to people who have acted as a mediator in a religious community or traditional dispute resolution and uh, based, you know, processes in which you know, localities where there's difficulty in attending mediation courses and or have worked as mediators prior to the enactment of uh, the rules, the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration, mediation rules. So if anyone has been a mediator before 31st of December 2015, or acted as a mediator in a religious or in a you know, community-based or traditional dispute resolution-based uh, process, you then qualify to be on our panel, and you may not necessarily need to attach all these qualifications of uh, past degree, training in mediation, and, and, and whatnot. So we do have instances where we have applicants from the northeastern part of Kenya, and they have obviously not have had any training, but they have been conducting these mediations in their communities for, for years on end. And the center looks at their experience, which would then be contained in their resume, and you are admitted even if you do not have a first, a first, first degree. Rashid spoke about you know, the place for young people who may need to, to be held, to someone to hold your hand. And the, cent the center is currently in the process of developing a mentorship uh, program for young mediators and young arbitrators who are fresh from training. They have not had their first uh, appointment as a mediator or arbitrator. And this mentorship program will now focus on the young people who are keen on having mentors. And it will, should run for about uh, a year to a year and a half. And you're attached to mediators doing certain cases with the center or for the arbitrators then arbitrations being done or conducted by the center. And through this process, you're able to now get the experience you need for your sole um, uh, appointment. So I will leave it at that. I'm sure there'll be questions arising from uh, this process of accreditation and I'll be happy to, to answer them. Back to you, Angari. Thank you very much, Alex. And just as our request that uh, could NCI please come with some good news, at least we've had some snippets of some good news from yourselves today. And also we do hope that the colleagues on the call have been able to have a closer touch of being able to understand NCIA and being able to appreciate that the NCIA panel is actually available and it's available for we. It is we now to um, take the step and be able to engage with um, uh, NCIA. Uh, for Wasilian Hub uh, community colleagues, we will be uh, keeping close touch with Alex because it is our commitment that by the end of this year, as long as you tag yourself as Wasilian Hub, uh, then the NCIA panel, you should be on it. And if there's something that's stopping you, then we take it as our responsibility to support you through that. So thank you very much, Alex, for that uh, introduction. Uh, yeah. Colleagues on the call, Okay. Colleagues on the call, we will be uh, receiving um, Honorable Kendagor, who is the Deputy Registrar, the Court Annex Mediation at the Judiciary of Kenya. She will also share with us what is the way forward with regard to the Court Annex Mediation Program. We are saying that uh, we are in the ADR tomorrow season. So how does the judiciary itself fit in that? So, Honorable Kendagor, welcome to the call and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Wangare, and uh, the, the panelists and the participants. We are happy to join in the conversation. I bring you warm greetings from uh, the judiciary. Uh, we are also Respect catching up uh, on their behalf. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, we are happy to join in the conversation. Uh, Cotanex Mediation, as uh, you had mentioned in the introduction, 
uh, we currently are uh, uh, we are using there was an issue that was raised uh, about what are the rules or uh, what is it that uh, we are we are we are using now uh, we had uh, mediation practice uh, rules which were on a pilot first when we started uh, the rollout in 2016 and they were uh, piloted for use in the family and commercial division uh, we have since moved away from uh, from that and currently we are using practice directions which were gazetted by the Honorable Chief Justice. And uh, the intention is that uh, uh, we were happy to have gotten the country into a conversation about uh, ADR and generally um, the, the way forward. So uh, between then and now, there have been conversations about uh, ADR bills. Uh, there have been conversations about mediation bills. There's a, a, a bigger conversation that we are a, a part of together with NCIA on the ADR policy, on the national ADR policy. So currently we are using practice directions and uh, the beauty about practice directions is that it has given us a leeway to be able to uh, flex uh, as opposed to legislation which would require that we'd have to go back to parliament. And we have learned not that just from uh, the experience in what we are doing at the secretariat, but also from the feedback and the large uh, uh, conversations that uh, we have also benefited, uh, particularly with uh, uh, conversations with NCIA, uh, the many forums that we have had with uh, the lawyers, the feedback that we have gotten, including uh, during um, sensitization forums, as well as forums that have been uh, organized by different mediation training uh, institutions, as well as uh, uh, one of the conversations that we had with Wasiliana Hub. So the practice directions uh, are moved away from what we used to do in the, in the mediation rules. And uh, it's, it's been a learning process and we're happy that uh, we are now looking at a replication model that will be able to suit the needs that we have as a country. Uh, in terms of uh, accreditation, we also depend on accreditation by MAC. So we welcome uh, mediators to apply for accreditation. Uh, we will share with uh, uh, Wangare the materials that are surrounded, including the Code of Ethics. Uh, but if you'll allow me to just move to um, what is it that we do in Kota Next Mediation and uh, a prospect of the future, is uh, currently the, the, the rules and uh, the, the, the legislative policy that we have that supports us is, of course, based from the Constitution, but we also have Section 59 that establishes the Mediation Accreditation Committee. And it is that same section 59 that has uh, uh, also given the responsibility to the courts to be able to develop rules towards uh, mediation, uh, mediations that are done outside court. Currently what we have is uh, in court annex mediation is that we refer cases that have already been filed in court to court annex mediation, which means that uh, for clients to be able to benefit from our process, there must be already filed cases uh, that are pending in court and which have been screened and found suitable to benefit from court and ex mediation. The future uh, uh, th that uh, and the prospect that we see is that we are looking forward to an enforcement of Section 59, which provides for adoption of uh, settlement agreements that have been arrived for cases that have not yet been been filed in court. And that is where we are now looking uh, at uh, what where the role an enhanced role of uh, of mediators because uh, unless by the time we are launching into the country and coming up with rules and now saying that uh, these settlement agreements will be brought to court, we also do not want to uh, get into a, a, a place where now the settlement agreements are challenged in court either uh, because of the issue of format, uh, procedure, uh, rules of natural justice, the manner in which the, the, the settlement agreements have been presented. We'd like to have a, a, a bet that gives us a, helps us realize the objective of mediation, where we have settlement agreements that are drawn by mediators that meet the uh, legal standards or uh, do not end up being challenged in court. And then we have clients getting frustrated having gone through mediation. And then those settlement agreements are challenged in court and uh, subsequently set aside and perhaps parties have to go through the adversarial process. So with the, with the, with the rules that we are currently working on, uh, settlement agreements that mediators have assisted parties to reach or uh, arrive at will be adopted in court without any case being filed in court. So they, and this now uh, gives um, an added advantage to the issue of uh, enforcement, which has been 
one of the biggest conversations that we have had even then as we sell out the mediation agenda to uh, to not only court users uh, but to members of the public and uh, to mediators who share the same vision with us. Uh, aside from that is uh, um, a focus again on, uh, of course, what has been raised uh, about the legislative uh, and policy from frameworks that exist in our country. And we are excited that now at least we have more, uh, a, a, a larger field or we can say um, an interest in, in uh, surrounding ADR. And so we are looking forward to uh, not just uh, relying on the judiciary to carry their, their agenda on alternative dispute resolution, but uh, help us to even focus more that we can actually work towards reducing the cases that are coming to court uh, for adversarial uh, dispute resolution. We are looking at uh, uh, culture change. I think one of the issues that was also raised, and we are working on a culture change strategy that will uh, give a shift of focus from the adversarial dispute resolution to now resolution of disputes through, uh, through mediation. And of course, uh, while at the same time selling the agenda on uh, the other alternative dispute uh, resolution mechanisms. Uh, I'm very interested, particularly since I've seen uh, with the young mediators, the issue on conversation by Rashid about mentorship. Uh, and uh, it's, it's really, it, it can't have come at a better time because we, we need to change the conversation and um, uh, by, by just beginning with even creating relations. Uh, the, the, the trainings that we have and one of the challenges that we have had, especially with the lawyers uh, and, and perhaps the mediators who are here will uh, share uh, or uh, have had an experience or so, is the, the having to bring our lawyers to understand what is their role in mediation. So a shift of focus also to now have a younger generation interested in alternative dispute resolution for us will help us to achieve this national outlook or uh, achieve the culture change strategy uh, that we hope to achieve. We are working on uh, sensitization uh, uh, forums that we'd also be very happy to uh, work alongside uh, uh, similar people that we share the same vision. So Wangare and uh, the team, we welcome uh, opportunities that we can have that either are scheduled by, from our end or from your end that can help us to achieve that. Uh, in terms of uh, um, ODR, uh, we are also working towards a shift now into uh, uh, online dispute resolution. We have developed guidelines and uh, this morning I was happy to be part of a conversation that uh, now even proposes that perhaps we should even move away from guidelines and look at rules that are developed that will guide uh, virtual uh, mediation. We're happy that we've, uh, for the COVID period, we've been able to settle eight matters. Uh, we are still reaching out to the mediators who are able, uh, who are in our register and are able to uh, conduct the virtual um, mediation while at the same time helping us to uh, achieve and uh, as well observe the uh, practice guidelines that we have or the promises and the objectives that we have given on quarter next mediation. Uh, I think that is what I, would, uh, I, I hope to uh, is the message from the judiciary but uh, aside from that we are ha happy to uh, join in the conversation get feedback um, from you as well as uh, maybe just touch a bit on um, uh, participation in uh, legislative forums or uh, when we have opportunities that uh, enable or give us an, uh, an opportunity to benefit in the legislative process. It's always, uh, it's very nice to participate there and then than having to work on uh, amendments or proposals that we are giving uh, thereafter. So uh, back to you, Wangare, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Honorable Kendagor, thank you uh, for um, the brief that you've given us. Uh, I, I can see that we have a number of uh, court annex mediators on the call. They may have questions. Please remember you can be able to uh, send in your questions on the chat. Uh, that will allow our facilitators, uh, uh, Alex, Mon Alex Moniki, Honorable Kendagor, and also our young mediators, Rashid Mwiza and Lily Miner and uh, Shanti Abrahams, who's uh, just about to speak to us, to be able to take them on, just as uh, we go to completing this, uh, this call. So once again, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Kend Caroline Kendagor and Alex Moniki for this introduction, which um, allows us to be very prepared and very ready for our 
uh, keynote speaker for today, our guest speaker, who is um, uh, Shanti Abraham. Shanti, you can say hello. Hello, Karibu, Kenya. Hi, like Hi, Karibu. I <laughs> uh, bring you okay, warm so greetings from uh, Kuala Lumpur <laughs> in Malaysia. Uh, this is a thank real you. privilege and an honor. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Wangari, for that warm welcome. Okay. And uh, Honorable Kandagor, Alex, Rashid, and Lily for the introduction to and giving me an insight into the mediation space in Kenya. Um, okay. I like that. So that means that now you have, uh, you're now Kenyanized in your mediation context. But yes, but we truly want you to wear 200% of your Asian uh, experience and also Asian training and also other international training, uh, focus and practice um, in mediation. So Shanti, right. you'll allow me to uh, request that you can kindly just give us a brief introduction on who you are yourself. Right. Right. So, uh, have I'm you a, uh, have you done any engagement with Kenya? I uh, know I've never visited Africa, and it's something I'd like to do. Um, when I first graduated from university uh, many years ago, uh, I actually wanted to come and visit the Okavango Valley because uh, in the 1990s it was we we I was from Singapore and we were fascinated with Okavango Valley and and Africa. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't make it there, and I would say yet. Uh, it is definitely on my plans mm -hmm. to come and visit Africa. I, in fact, uh, have distant relatives who live in uh, some places in Africa. So it's on my bucket list. Okay. And this is well, a privilege okay. to be able to okay. see so many of you here. Okay. So Shanti, please tell us a bit about yourself. Absolutely. We see you. So who, yes, who, a, bit about, a bit about you. I'm happy to share. Now, um, I've been a lawyer for 25 years. I've trained in both Malaysia and in Singapore. And I, my hats that I wore as a lawyer are as a corporate lawyer, where I do joint ventures, I list companies, and I buy and sell infrastructure projects. I'm also a dispute resolution lawyer, a litigator who has uh, argued all the way up to the federal courts, and that's the highest courts in Malaysia. And uh, like Rashid, uh, litigation was not, not always a fully satisfactory uh, method where I felt that my clients were able to find good and swift and smart solutions to some of their, uh, so some of their larger problems. Now, I never heard about mediation until the mid-2000s, but I need to share with you that mediation in the formal process has been in Malaysia and Singapore since around 1999. And uh, the early mediators who were trained uh, were fascinated with the prospect of mediation. Unfortunately, the value proposition for mediators was not very good. Everyone expected mediators to do things for free or for very cheap. And it's very hard to have something sustainable when someone expects you to do it uh, as a hobby or as charity. And so mediation took a long time to slowly uh, grow in, in Malaysia and Singapore. Now, at some point, uh, there was a divergence, I have to share. And you will know that even though Malaysia and Singapore started the mediation journey at the same time, in Singapore, there was a lot more prominence and it took off in a different way. Now, uh, just a little bit more about my background so you can see where it fits. I first trained as a mediator in Malaysia and I was sold on we, we also have an accreditation program which requires us to have a minimum of 40 hours training with an assessment and that is to ensure that we meet the international standards for mediators having trained in malaysia i went back to my old hometown in singapore to also retrain in singapore so um unlike uh, some institutions that do cross recognition uh, Singapore required us to retrain and it's the same thing in Malaysia and this was because even in those days standards for mediators was something that was important and imperative. Uh, after training in Singapore I was invited to be part of the teaching faculty uh, in Singapore and so I used to fly down from Malaysia and teach mediators in Singapore same time I would volunteer in the court annex mediation in Singapore where I 
built my pilot flying hours. And that's how we used to position it. Because before you can be launched into the public arena where you are solving, helping parties solve their problems, um, accreditation alone is not enough. You need to have some pilot flying hours. And so I used to do that. I'd fly from Malaysia to Singapore for my pilot flying hours. Unfortunately, at that time, and even now, Malaysia did not have a um, port annex mediation program that allowed external mediators to participate. And we're hoping to change that. So we're, you know, we're at a crossroads here, even here in Malaysia. So moving on, uh, teaching and doing mediation continued to inspire me. And I was blessed to be surrounded by incredibly enthusiastic mediators, particularly in Singapore, who then inspired me that if I want to do this and I want to do this professionally, I needed to get more credentialing. And so I went to Harvard for the program on mediation where I met many people, including one mediator from Nigeria, if I'm not mistaken. And it was a, a, a wonderful experience to meet other like-minded mediators and I made the decision that when I would come back, I would reframe my law practice to be a mediate first law practice. Now, I might have been one of the first few in Malaysia to reframe my practice that way. But the reason was this. Up to about 2013, uh, the, the cases that used to go before mediators were those which were considered bad cases. But if you went to mediation conferences, people would say, if you have a good case and you know why you're going to win, that's an even better reason to mediate first. Mm -hmm. And that captivate, captivated my mind and imagination. And so I reframed my practice a bit. Having said that, the reality check was this. In order to build a sustainable business, I needed to have a broad spectrum of practice. So I continued to do my corporate work. I continued to do my litigation where it was necessary. And I also opened myself to be a mediation advocate as well as a mediator. So I wore many hats. And in that, those years, I also became an arbitrator because in my career plan, uh, reaching more than 20 years in practice, I felt that being an arbitrator fit with my problem solving uh, mantle and I'm uh, also an adjudicator for the construction industry as well as the capital market industry. So I juggle many hats and I treasure every single one of them because with each hat I wear, I'm able to help uh, parties find solutions to their problem. The tagline is not so much whether it's alternative, but appropriate. Depending on the case that's in front of you, one as a lawyer needs to determine what is the appropriate approach to help the clients get the solution that makes sense for them, commercially, financially, and in any respects to, in order to find a solution to the problem. So in a quick summary, uh, that's been my journey. And I think uh, Wangare also uh, has very well researched. I was nominated uh, for sponsorship to be trained as an investor state mediator. And most recently that was in 2018. And I'm a real believer in this process. I went back to Harvard to also do my advanced mediation training. So uh, I'm not only a teacher, but a student as well. And uh, I'm continually building my mediation skills. Our mediators toolbox is a very large one. And we can only learn from every single mediation that we do. I hope that's a short enough summary about my, my experience. <laughs> yes, it, 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 it's a very good uh, roundup. And I'm saying it's a very good roundup because it's helped us see your journey, uh, uh, whether you know, someone is on the call here and they come from a legal background, they're a lawyer or they are a non-lawyer, they can actually see yourself, yes. the pathway you have chosen. Um, and most of all, especially when you now chose to um, add on to your Right. Uh, credentials uh, by choosing Harvard, the uh, program on uh, negotiation. And I'd like to pick on uh, specifically that decision to top up because already you are acceptable in Malaysia, you are acceptable yes. now in Singapore when you moved in. So what was the basis of making that choice that I need to top up? And here, yes. if you're a Kenyan mediator on this call, 
am speaking into us because for a great majority, once you do the 40 hour, because in Kenya, you yes. require the 40 hour from right. um, where the, the, the training organization you do um, engage in, and now some are in 50 hours or 60 hours, then we, we stop there. Because anyway, that's what Alex and that's what Honorable Kenda require of us. So yes. what is that that caused you to choose to go for the program? And I'm saying right. that because it's also not a program for $100. Uh, no, yes. it's a very expensive so program. So how much money has it cost? It is, yes. And also yes. just the value. But uh, if you can focus on that, that academic. And the equivalent of a law degree uh, in, in going through to Harvard. So I have invested in my education, my mediation education. I take it very seriously as well. And I don't take it lightly in the sense that, um, so let me start why, what inspired me? Because that's a very, very good question. Now, I'm not sure where, if you, you, you can see where Malaysia and Singapore are on the map. We are very close to each other. We are one hour flights away from Kuala Lumpur to Singapore. Singapore, I can travel 10 minutes to the airport and I'm in Singapore in two hours. So we're very close by. So Singapore is like a second home. And if you remember what I said, Malaysia and Singapore started the journey at the same time. But I think Singapore had a little bit more vision to see that perhaps mediation was going to take off. So in 2012, in 2012, Already there was an energy in Singapore where among the mediators, the ones who were taking this seriously were already talking about upskilling to make sure that you're on top of your game. Harvard was talked about, Pepperdine was also talked about. These are the two schools that were very highly respected. And there was a leaning towards Harvard because when we train in the Singapore Mediation Center, we use the Harvard Seven Elements as one of our as one of the backbone uh, um, rubrics for, to, to teach. So uh, in my mind, uh, going to Harvard and learning more skills from there was on my to-do list. I didn't do that overnight uh, because I was running a law firm with uh, lots of lawyers and you know, uh, it's not easy to just take a few weeks off to go off and, and do this. And I had very young children. Uh, at that time. But I made a promise to myself that in 2014, I was going to go. So I took two years to plan to do this. And the reason was this, I already felt the energy on the ground. If you ask me what was my inspiration, even then I already saw that I felt mediation was going to take off in a way that made sense. It just made a lot more sense. One of my areas of practice is medical negligence. And that was my initial focus. But I found the worst was pushback from the insurance companies who did not seem to want to solve their problems fast. They preferred the longer dispute resolution process. I hope six, seven years from then, which is now, insurance companies are going to start changing it. It's going to take some time. So that's why I chose to do Harvard. And in tandem with going to Harvard, I also decided to reframe my practice. So I didn't stop doing litigation, but I certainly looked at my cases in a way to see what would be the most appropriate way to help my clients. So I wear my hat sometimes as a mediator and sometimes as a mediation advocate. And if I could just share one point with my, my, my new Kenyan friends, if you're a lawyer and if you are already a trained mediator, Ask yourself how many of your own cases you have referred for mediation yourself. This is an important naval base for all of us. And I ask this, this question even to my Malaysian friends, because a lot of us train as mediators and we all wait for appointments as mediators. But when push comes to shove, it takes a lot more effort to move our own cases to mediation. And one of okay. our colleagues from Singapore shared with us that how mediation grew in Singapore was the spirit of referring mediations between lawyers so that our fellow mediators would get experience. And experience is really important, not just accreditation, but experience. Because in order to be able to uh, hold the room, to have the gravitas over not just two people, but sometimes 14 people, you need to have gravitas on the ground, or you need to have uh, practice on the ground. Right? Wangari? Um, 
Yes, uh, thank you. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. That is uh, uh, very clarifying in terms of um, the, the inspiration uh, which uh, comes with you having the vision uh, beyond even the personal passion um, to, to invest in, in your growth. And yeah. also at the back of it, I also hear a community of uh, mediators who yes. have came together and that also provided you like a, a place or you found a place where you could layer on and then you were able to grow together and challenge each other as you develop this pathway. Yeah. So thank you for that. Um, allow me to be able to now uh, shift the discussion a little bit to oh. us looking at um, um, Asia, uh, us understanding Asia and Malaysia. I mean, how sure. would you describe the, the, the people? How would you describe the business community? I mean, just the general right. nature of the people, the institutions, <laughs> business, yeah. Okay, so Malaysia, we're a plural society. We're many races, as well as many religions. We've got many cuisines. So those of you from Kenya who would like to come for a holiday, let me do my pitch for Malaysian tourism. When the borders are finally open, if you come to Malaysia, you will have many, many cuisines to enjoy. And why do I refer to cuisines? Apart from the fact that our food is fantastic, one of the things that we say when we talk about appropriate dispute resolution is we say that clients who are in difficulties, who are looking for solutions, must be offered a buffet of options. And a buffet of options means you have different types of ways to resolve your dispute. It can be through neutral evaluation. It can be through mediation. It can be through expert determination adjudication, arbitration, and litigation. And once you know that there are all these potential opportunities, the lawyers, because we are the gatekeepers when there is a problem, should be able to evaluate each of them with our clients and strategize which one makes sense. Now, in Malaysia, our business community, because we're part of ASEAN, and ASEAN, if I could describe it, is 10 very, very diverse countries, ranging from Thailand and Laos and Cambodia and Brunei and Indonesia and Philippines and Singapore, which we form a block, a trading block. We also have a lot of trade with China, India, and, and the United States and Australia. So we have a very, very unique trading position where we welcome trade with any country where, uh, where you know, we, we have lots of Africans who come to Malaysia as students, um, not so much trade, but I could be wrong. Um, but essentially we are a very plural society, very welcoming, very warm people. But when there is a problem, people still think of court as the place the problem is solved. And we have a British uh, adversarial court system heritage, which still carries on today. Now, when we talk about mediation, Asian culture, and I know this is about Kenyan culture as well, people were solving problems in a mediative way for hundreds of years before the adversarial system came to Malaysia. So we try to remind our people about a cultural heritage of amicable problem solving, looking at the underlying interests of all the parties and not just a rights-based approach to solve their problems. That's my two and a half minute introduction to Malaysia. Malaysia. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. So with that background, how does that influence um, the, the acceptability? of mediation or how, how has that influenced in the three contexts, the positioning, the policy, and now the practice? So probably we can start off in terms of on the positioning, how has it influenced that? Then now you can yeah. take us through what is the policies in my yes. uh, structure and then practice by practitioners like yourself, ourselves. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to I'm going to take you through a little journey about mediation in Malaysia in the first place, because the positioning was not just a one-off event. When mediation first was introduced to Malay in Malaysia in 1999, the people who were trained were the senior lawyers, the litigators, who did not see any commercial benefit in changing their practice. And so mediation, our Malaysian Mediation Center, which I've been an ex-co for more than 10 years, is entirely voluntary. 
we have one employee and every single one of us is a volunteer. We teach for free. So if you can imagine, we close our office or our departments for five days to train other mediators to join our fold. Now we do it as part of giving back. The problem with the concept of giving back is that it got reframed as something that only the rich and about to be retired or rather bored would do. And that was not the right message, sadly. And once that became a little bit entrenched, it became a bit difficult to commercialize mediation. Eventually, the court started doing mediation as well, and court annex mediation started in around 2010. So the position of mediation moved from the more charitable position to a court annex position. But what was the reason it was put in Malaysian courts? Was because we had a backlog of cases. So the then judiciary looked at mediation as a way of clearing the backlog. And so for those of us who are trained in mediation, the kind of mediation we saw in court was not quite um, the way facilitative mediation is done. Because unfortunately, the judges, as well as the registrars, they had what they call KPIs. And a KPI is called a key performance index. So towards the end of the month, they'll need to report back to their bosses on how many cases they have successfully mediated. So it was a little bit more pressure than I think a lot of parties and lawyers might have liked. Uh, another part of the problem, and this was something I wrote about in 2011, was the fact that lawyers routinely got kicked out of the mediation chamber. Lawyers were treated as obstructive. Lawyers were treated as uncooperative. And unfortunately, when the lawyers felt that they were disrespected, what they would do was to prime their clients to say, go in there, tell the judge you won't make a decision without the lawyer. And sometimes it worked and sometimes the clients agreed to what the judge said only to come out and say, well, I was forced by the judge into that agreement. So the name of mediation started to be a bit sullied. And, and we were a bit concerned about that. Having said that, we have some amazing judge mediators who are properly trained, you know, using the five-day course. And if you went before them, you would feel fully satisfied that you had a well-trained mediator. So I, I don't mean to say this about everyone, right? I, I, this was experienced by different people. Until today, the practice has been that uh, some of the mediator judges do not include the lawyers in the process. So lawyers felt sidelined in court and next mediation, unfortunately. Meanwhile, the narrative about mediators was that this was a nice retirement job. So people were a bit puzzled when I, at the you know, 20 years in practice, I decided to have a mediate first policy. My inspiration was obviously coming from Singapore where there were the, the conversations about mediation was much more ahead. And if you now know why in Singapore there was bubbling enthusiasm, it was because they were already working very hard on this convention, which has now been named after them, which is the, the, uh, the Convention on for Mediated Settlement Agreements. Now, in Singapore, on the other hand, in comparison, you had TV programs which featured mediation. So the lexicon and language of mediation became part and parcel of the community, right? Lawyers were included in mediation. So I used to fly down to Singapore, do mediations, lawyers were included, and we would treat the lawyers with tremendous respect. After all, lawyers are the gatekeepers of the problem. And a decent lawyer, would often need to nudge their clients to consider mediation. So even more reason for us as mediators to respect the role of the lawyer in the mediation chamber. And this is what I'd like to think I brought back to Malaysia. And there are many mediators in Malaysia who, like me, we welcome lawyers. We, in fact, encourage lawyers to be part of the picture. Now, in terms of industries in Malaysia, the construction industry was the first one 20 years ago to see that mediation would help with some of their problems. Unfortunately, as an industry, it didn't quite take off and adjudication became more prominent over time. 
But thank, I mean, in, in light of COVID, and thanks to the, the conversations that are already happening on webinars everywhere, I'm hearing, I'm hearing the construction industry is having a renewed look at mediation to see whether mediation will be able to unlock some of the cash flow demands and needs of the construction industry, which are currently in peril because of the COVID crisis. So we are at crossroads, even here in Malaysia. Uh, one of the things the Malaysian Mediation Center is doing, so it's still part of the issue about our positioning, our continually changing positions, but a new policy that may be coming out and rolling out in the next few months is a national COVID-19 mediation initiative, which is being led by the Malaysian Mediation Center. We have 600 over mediators. Uh, the conventional knowledge is that most of our mediators uh, have not had a lot of experience in mediation, but they are extremely enthusiastic to contribute. And these mediators will be refreshed and put uh, to assist in this national mediation, uh, COVID-19 mediation initiative. It hasn't started yet. It's still pending approval, of course, but I'm, I'm happy to share with it because the vision is already out there and we, we know there is a need. There's a tsunami of cases in Malaysia. I don't know how it is in Kenya, but from landlord and tenant to construction, employer, employee, uh, vendor contracts, these are all... Uh, all people who I need uh, of some solutions, and there's no one to blame, actually. It just needs parties to sit down and come up with a solution that they can live with. Wangare? Hey, yes, yes. Um, thank you very much, Shanti. Uh, I'd like to take us um, to uh, the Mediation Act. Uh, okay. yeah, so okay. in, yes, yeah, and uh, if you could kindly just uh, help us understand the the legislative landscape uh, and also the policy elements. And I say this because um, uh, Honorable Kendagor did point out with regard to the ADR policy discussions that were held last year. Uh, mm -hmm. We were very, very uh, communicative and still maintain that we would, uh, we are looking for a mediation act for Kenya. Would you please enlighten us what's been Happy your... To. Yeah, your so journey. Things, Thank you. Yes, one of the things we're very proud about in Malaysia is that we came out with the Mediation Act in 2012. And in 2012, the Mediation Act that came up protected confidentiality, mediator in immunity, and the uh, elements of without prejudice. Of course, confidentiality is subject to certain exceptions. Now, one thing that was missing, unfortunately, were the enforcement provisions. Now, it was not so much that it was not thought about, the early drafters of our Mediation Act in 2010, 11, and 12 actually already foresaw the need for enforcement provisions to give mediation that bite. Um, unfortunately, at that time, our legislative drafters did not feel it was crucial, and that was not included in the 2012 mediation. Let's move forward now to where we are. Malaysia is a signatory to the Singapore Convention on Mediation. So we are currently revamping the Mediation Act. We're also looking at the Singapore Convention uh, Mediation Act, which will be when we ratify the convention which we have signed. Some of the provisions we are looking at to make our Malaysian, the new Malaysian Mediation Act more robust is to have uh, clear enforcement provisions where mediated settlement agreements, particularly by senior mediators, will be convertible to orders of the court. Now, I heard and I took a note that you have a section 59 that you're looking at, which will have that sort of effect. And in Singapore, they have it in section 12 of the Singapore Mediation Act, where if you're a senior, uh, a semi certified mediator, which is a level four mediator, and you do a mediation before such a mediator, that, and it must be a pre-action mediation, that mediated settlement agreement can be registered in the court. So we're looking to have something similar because we recognize that in order for mediation to um, get the respectability it deserves, the outcome of the mediation must also be satisfactory. As um, Honorable Kendergrog said, you know, uh, at the end of the day, it would be very disappointing for parties to go through the whole mediation process 
only to find there are impediments uh, if one of the parties were not to fulfill a promise that was made. Uh, so we are looking at the Act. Our Act is about to be amended in the next, in the course of the next one year, I foresee that our Act will be amended. We have a current one. And the reason why we are amending it is because in Malaysia, we recognize this is a moving space. And perhaps I will have a look at the Kenyan mediation bill as well. Maybe we will get some good ideas. Yes, uh, thank you for that, uh, uh, um, Shanti. Uh, I'd like us to uh, uh, focus on uh, our last uh, part of the Inquisition uh, in this discussion with yourself. And uh, specifically, it's with regard to the empanelment. Empanelment and practice. Uh, okay. Yes, yes. Um, okay. uh, we, we, we sent out uh, your bio together with uh, the panels that you're in, and they make a booklet. Oh, did so you? <laughs> would you please just, yes, oh. would you please just, and uh, just uh, help us understand the, the panels, the panels you're on, you're on right. CME, you're on the Singapore International Mediation, which yes. is uh, Institute, you are on the Malaysian Mediation Center, and That's also just, right. uh, plus also other, with others, which some are government appointed, some yes. are, okay, the training with, with the World Bank, and then, so some are independent, you you choose to be a member yourself, like for example, the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration. Uh, some could be because of it's because there is work, or some it's because of the identity. Could you please probably take us through like sure. five uh, of uh, them you know, that help us to understand? If I forget one of panels, just remind me because I'm just going to go shall. through them. That's okay. <laughs> now, the Malaysian Mediation Center, in order to be on that on the panel, you need to have gone through the accreditation process. Once you're part of the done the accreditation process, you'll be invited to be part of the panel. Now, um, we are selective when people do training uh, in other institutions. So what we do is we'll ask the parties if they feel that they have done an accreditation process. There is a process where they all have to do an assessment and then our EXCO will make an assessment whether that person can be impaneled on the Malaysian Mediation Center panel. Now, in Malaysia, we're a very small mediation community. In the early days, especially, you could, once you are accredited on the Malaysian Mediation Center, you could apply for uh, empanelment on the, at that time known as the Kuala Lumpur Regional Center for Arbitration. They also had a mediation panel. Now it's known as the Asian Institute of Arbitration, uh, the AIAC. So you will find the names pretty much on both panels, but they are accredited. Uh, by, by the Malaysian Mediation Center. Um, the AIAC has their own impanelment uh, process, and I believe that they also have a lot of international mediators on their panel as well. Now, moving on to Singapore. Singapore also, you need to go through the accreditation process, and then you are invited to be part of the panel. And uh, usually there is an annual fee uh, for both all of these panels. You'll have a, to pay some minimum annual fee uh, to be part of the panel. Now, um, I have been invited to be on uh, several different panels, like particularly in Hong Kong, the uh, IDCR. I can't remember what the full name is. And, and these were invitations which were born out of MOUs signed between uh, Malaysia and these countries. So to give you an example, um, uh, the Malaysian Mediation Center recently signed an online uh, MOU, the first ever, with a Belt and Road uh, Mediation Center. And each center nominated 10 um, 10 mediators to the initial joint panel. So I'm a, one of the first 10 mediators on that initial joint panel. Uh, so that's an example of how and panels and panelments work. Um, there are also other uh, panels like um, uh, the, the Singapore International Mediation Institute. Now for that, it's a recognition of your mediation experience. Now, CIMI follows the IMI standards, which is when you've accumulated 20 media full mediations or 200 hours of mediations, which you can produce feedback forms so that it is auditable. And then you go through another assessment. So after 
doing your many, many mediations, you go through another assessment uh, and they will put you through the role play, which is more complex because you're going to be holding a position where your potential mediated settlement agreement can be converted to a court order. So the, the standards and the rigors are, uh, are much higher. And so I went through that process and I am now a CME certified mediator. And CME has um, a cross recognition with IMI and therefore I'm an IMI certified mediator as well. Now, I'm not a very, I'm not really in favor of collecting plenty of panels. Uh, some of it I've been very blessed to be included and invited. At the end of the day, as many panels as I'm on, what matters the most is the contribution to that institution. And in order to contribute to an institution, you can contribute not just as a mediator, but also a mediation advisor and advocate who refers cases to that particular center, which gives a job to another mediator. So I have in my capacity as a mediation advocate appointed many lawyers, or sorry, many mediators, uh, invariably lawyers, uh, to be mediators in matters which involve my clients. So it's important that we walk the talk in both directions. It's no point just sitting and waiting to be a mediator without at first, volunteering and putting forward your client's cases to be mediated. It, the ecosystem has to come together. Um, one panel that I do a lot of work on is my capital markets uh, panel, which is SIDREC. It is a securities industries dispute resolution center. I was, that would be one panel where I was invited to be part of the panel. And one of the pre-qualifications was my capital market legal work experience. So it's not just something that any mediator can join. You need to demonstrate knowledge in that particular area. And a point to note about the CIDREC uh, panel, it is a limited panel. So they, they're not accumulating lots of mediators. They've got um, a, a, a small group of mediators. You can check it on the website. And the benefit of having a small group of mediators is that there is more opportunities for those mediators to build the skills and slowly will build the capacity for other mediators. Have I missed out any other panel that you might want me to share on? That, that gives the that gives the, the gist of um, the context which is uh, with regard to that the opportunities are there either by invitation or by creating them even as a, a pool yes. of peers. And um, I say that because um, uh, as Wasili and Ahab, we have uh, seven pillars, which we are building on um, uh, running through the first half of this year. And right. uh, the, the intention is that we are able to support mediators to be able to develop themselves in specialist areas, specialist right. areas. Like for instance, yourself, you have said that in health I mean, you, 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 you mediate in healthcare. healthcare. Well, yes, that's right. Yes. Yeah, you mediate in healthcare and for you to mediate then in healthcare, then uh, there are certain uh, either either work you've done in it or you take some very deliberate um, training in it. On screen, you have uh, Christina Gatura, who is um, an, uh, with 25 years of experience in the educational sector. Um, we are running the Thrive Commercial Dispute Resolution Service, mm. which is a service uh, for uh, chief executive officers and chief finance officers who know that time, money, and business reputation matter to them. Absolutely. And uh, specifically, this is to be able to support them so that we can get them have more satisfied customers um, uh, right. where we are, where they, where they are. So the speaking engagements are cutting across our more senior mediators and also uh, like Rashid is also part of um, um, on, um, on, on this, uh, on this uh, same program. It's a program we are running with our pro mediators. Pro mediators have uh, gone a notch higher as uh, part of our team. So we know we can dispatch them to Malaysia and they can be able to represent and speak um, into mediation and um, on other areas because either they have a specialist area or they've actually built um, capacity in that. Family wealth mediation is an um, area which we have developed um, um, uh, a course with uh, a, 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 a practitioner in uh, uh, trusts and estate planning so that we can, yes. because for us we're saying that families, it's possible for families and family enterprises to work. 
So that is uh, just an illustration of how we are moving into the commercial dispute resolution service. Right. And uh, with this, it's even um, a, a, a question uh, back to Honorable Kendagor when, uh, uh, when uh, the moderator, Sarah, uh, takes on uh, the questions, when will the agreements that we have with the clients as part of the Thrive Commercial Dispute Resolution Service be enforceable at the courts? Because we know that it makes a difference when clients know that the agreements can actually be taken in by the court, or if not that, then institutions like the NCIA, when is it that we are able to now have um, such arrangements? We have numerous um, uh, SMEs because this is a service which we are targeting strongly that can support the uh, small, medium, and um, micro enterprises uh, that do not uh, spend time to uh, be in the, let's say, the court backlog or will not have the money to be able to uh, spend uh, on the litigation process, or even if they do have it, time, reputation matter to you. Yes. So Shanti, I'd like to thank you for uh, this discussion that we've had with you. I'd like to hand over to um, our moderator, uh, Sarah who will be receiving any quick comments and queries from our young mediators and also our yeah. facilitators, Alex and Honorable Kendagor, um, that are addressed to you. And then we'll right. be able to receive the questions that are on the uh, or comments uh, that are on the chat. So welcome, okay. uh, mediator Sarah. Yes, uh, th thank you very much, uh, Wangari. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Shanti, for uh, helping us uh, understand how it is on the other side. Uh, we'll just uh, give an opportunity to the speakers that uh, we had before to be able to uh, uh, bring up any comments or issues that they might have. And uh, we'll have Lily go first, uh, followed by Rashid, if they have any comment or question directed towards uh, uh, Shanti. Uh, Lily? Lily, are you on? Or we go to Rashid and then we'll come back to Lily. So um, Rashid, oh, you are on. Okay, thank you, Lily. Uh, please uh, go fast. Okay, sorry. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Shanti, for that uh, presentation. It was very insightful. I was uh, actually in awe seeing some of the similarities that uh, we can have with, Ma with Malaysia. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. Kenya is mostly known for borrowing laws and copy pasting. But uh, when you said that there are some provisions in your act that didn't provide for uh, enforcement, no, and I thought, um, our bill is actually providing for such uh, provisions, I was like, yeah. oh, we are not doing that bad. We are actually... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was really insightful. Um, and also on the issue of um, judges in your country that are actually trained mediators, they don't include lawyers in their, in their process as it is, they are deemed as destructive, they distract a lot. Uh, well, I'm sure most of the practitioners will sort of agree with that especially here in Kenya. Well, I don't know how they'll take it if they're told they can't be in that room. So <laughs> we are yet to see if some of these things will be taken up. I don't know if Honorable Kendagor uh, can actually advise for this because she's the DR in, in, the, in, in charge of mediation in the judiciary. I don't know if she can take it up with the, with the judiciary and have that. We don't know. We'll see how that goes. So I don't have a question, but just those few comments. And thank you for that presentation. And uh, yeah, and before I take it back to uh, Sarah, there are some questions I had raised in the, in the chat. Perhaps she'll refer them to uh, our speakers, Honorable Kendagor and Mr. Alex. Thank you so much. Back to you, Sarah. Uh, thank you, Lily. Actually, one of the questions that uh, Lily raised, uh, she said, what is the place of mediation settlement agreements that are informally done, especially at the community level? For example, those who just shake hands, uh, slaughter bulls to symbolize agreement and uh, peace. And then another one, so Honorable Kendagor, you can put that down for a little later. What happens when the parties have agreed and one party does not honor the agreement? So that is uh, 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 something else. And another one that uh, was from Lily, 
uh, to Alex. She was asking, what are your thoughts on the, the same, the issue of the agreements and how can mediation agreements be defined to accommodate those informal mediation uh, agreements? Uh, 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 probably Honorable Con Kendagor, you can put this, uh, uh, no, this will be for a little later. Uh, yes, so uh, I'll give an opportunity for Rashid uh, to be able to have his uh, comments or questions uh, to the rest of the panel. Kindly, Rashid. Uh, okay, you're yes, muted you. now. Yes, thank you, Sarah and Shanti, for that wonderful presentation. It was really helpful and uh, full of insights that I can appreciate as a young mediator. Now, I don't have any question, but what I can say is, in view of all what we have said, what you, what you have told us, we can learn a few things uh, from uh, Singapore and Malaysia, how they have, how you have, you have seen what is happening in Singapore and emulated it in Malaysia, how you have develop the interest in mediation. And despite having 25 years of experience in litigation, you still thought you need that satisfaction in whatever work you are doing. You feel perhaps if in litigation, there is somebody who's going to lose. There's one party that is going to lose. That means they'll pay the cost and to their detriment, they might suffer some, some sort of hurt, emotional hurt that is not, going to, is not going to be easy for them. So in my view and in my experience, that is one of the things that I could relate to because at, the, at this stage of my life, I feel litigation is not enough because I've seen people cry because they have lost cases. I've seen families angry at each other because they're they are not in good terms because of the parcel of land that they're mm -hmm. arguing about. So yeah. the experiences that you have connected in your, in your shift from litigation to mediation are very relatable to me right now because I want to follow that spectrum of experience where I will get to understand really how can alternative dispute resolution mechanisms come in to, to become more primary and to complement where, where, where possible the, litigation, the, the dispute resolution processes that are present and uh, for the future of of the welfare of communities yeah. down at the grassroots. Okay, in, in the community perspective, because I really like to talk about the community, the community communities take time to understand what is happening or rather what is their best alternative. Whenever disputes arise, they tend to rush to courts. They need a lot of awareness they need a lot of understanding why mediation is the way to go or rather what alternative dispute resolution mechanisms are more, more recommended to litigation. They really need a lot of awareness. So in our view, okay, in my view, I would say if we, if, if we can get more, uh, more focus to the grassroots, then it's going to be easy for the mediation practitioners in any country, not just Kenya, in any country, if we can go to the grassroots and educate them, then we're going to, to change that uh, culture of litigation yeah. and we're going to encourage people to do more means of uh, solving disputes out of court. And mediation being one of them uh, is in a better position uh, to solve disputes even at the lowest level of, of the community. So, thank you with those few remarks. Thank you. Sarah, if I could just uh, say something, because I wanted to say this earlier and I forgot. Uh, Rashid mm -hmm. talked about um, mentor mediators, and I, I want to thank him for that idea. Because one of the things that uh, we were thinking of doing for the national mediation, uh, the national COVID 19 mediation initiative, was precisely that to identify mediators who would be prepared to be mentors to 
uh, not just younger mediators, but people who are just getting into mediation so that we create that ecosystem where mediators get support. I was very privileged that I had uh, friends from Singapore as well as Malaysia. And, and that was very important and imperative, even in making me take the brave steps forward. And I tell you, they are brave steps because this needs, this is a new, uh, a, a new dispute resolution style, no matter the fact that it's been done for hundreds of years. But in these days we need, and now we can even reach across the seas. Now, you know, there are friends who are mediators in Malaysia and Singapore. You know, by all means, we must have more interactions to support each other. Uh, it, as Lily pointed out, there's a lot we can learn from each other. Lily, just to clarify, the original conceivers of our Mediation Act definitely wanted enforcement. Unfortunately, the legislators didn't agree earlier. Today, they might be regretting it, but never mind. We'll get it back in there. And um, I think globally, we're going to see mediation take a very strong foot forward. From community to corporate, that's the rule. From community to corporate. Okay, um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Shanti. And uh, I think your last uh, comments about mediation uh, for you know people coming into the sector is a question that uh, Susan had for Alex and uh, Honorable Kendagor, where they ask uh, on the issue of mentorship: How do they consider older people who are from other professions and have trained as mediators? Uh, don't they also require mentorship in the mediation profession? So. Uh, Alex, you can take that as you give your final comment. So any question or comment that you might also have for Shanti. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I also just remember that Lily had asked about uh, a, question, a question about our rules. And indeed, yes, we do have mediation rules 2015. And these were enacted by Passwell Section 5 of the NCA Act, which of course um, mandates the center to develop rules encompassing conciliation and mediation process. So the rules are there and I invite all the participants today who have not had a chance to look at our rules to just peruse through them. It's you know, a very bulky document and you'll be able to see the process from the you know, receipt of our you know, request, request for mediation, the processes that the registrar undertakes all the way to the appointment of a mediator until you know, a settlement is reached. And the, the rules also contain a very interesting uh, aspect that maybe mediators are uh, be keen on the mediator fee, if you're having, conducting mediations under the NCIA, then how much then do you, you know, what is your fee and how, how is that paid? So it would be interesting if you have a chance to look through our rules, they will enlighten you more on, the, on our processes from commencement to, to, to the end. Um, Shanti, I have been yes. to Malaysia, thankfully, and I'm familiar with the slogan, Malaysia Truly Asia. Oh. <laughs> and we are very, we're very close to the Asian International Mission Centre, right. and uh, we've you know engaged in on several occasions, uh, joint uh, activities, and we hope you will then get to come to Kenya and enjoy our hospitality. Absolutely. And I also invite you to, of course, and all other participants today who are qualified mediators to join our panel. We'll be happy to receive your applications. You can never be in enough panels. The last aspect I think is someone asked about is the investment of mediation. Unfortunately, we are not able to, you know, there's only so much we can do on the enforcement of this mediation um, agreement. I'm sure on Rabokenda go will speak in detail uh, on that. But as, as it is now, we can only, you know, uh, request parties who have voluntarily come to this process yeah. and who are involved in, you know, the, the that settlement agreement to abide by it so that you then don't make, um, you know, we make use of the mediation process as it, sh it, sh it should be. And um, unless there's any other question, that would be all for me. I thank you all. Alex, did you actually handle the issue of uh, uh, mentorship for older, uh, older people coming into the sector? Oh, sorry, I had actually mentioned uh, in my earlier presentation on the mentorship and I did indicate that the center is in the process of developing a mentorship program. Uh, the initial reason for this mentorship program was we get so many applications from uh, freshly, uh, very, mostly young people, 
freshly graduated or and freshly just had their 40 hour 40 hour mediation training no experience whatsoever and uh, since the, then they don't qualify to be on the panel we felt it fit to have a mediation and arbitration mentorship program for any person who's freshly trained now not necessarily because you're young but you have no experience whatsoever in mediation once this program is out we will um, publicize it and request those people who are freshly trained, whether young or old, to come on board and uh, have their hands held by um, experienced uh, mediators like Shanti. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Honorable Kendagor, you uh, have your questions. Uh, in addition to the one that doesn't miss, uh, uh, Jane asked about the payment. So as you address the questions and any comments, then you can handle that as well. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I thank the panelists. It's always very refreshing to pick up conversations on mediation, especially with the already converted. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's not always a, an easy uh, process. Uh, especially when uh, you have to tackle the issue of uh, the role of advocates, like uh, the way very ably uh, Shanti addressed. And I'm, I'm very excited and happy that you raised it because uh, we need to look at uh, the journey or uh, the vision that we have about alternative dispute resolution collectively. If we work together in that uh, uh, we, we have... Uh, one of the things that, uh, maybe to, before I, I, I just I digress a little, uh, is I'm told that uh, as lawyers, our training is, uh, is more on uh, adversarial. So uh, we, are, we are taught to win disputes uh, through arguments. We are taught that it is uh, how you, you, you bring forward the issues. Uh, it is now that we are joining the converted to be able to talk that we can actually uh, get into a middle, uh, a middle ground in terms of dispute and not always having a, a win. Uh, and, and persuading them to, uh, that you can actually come up with a solution by you, for you, and uh, with a win-win situation. Uh, on the issue of, um, of training that has been raised by, by Lily, uh, coming from that background, we do not want to have our judges and our magistrates left behind in the conversation. So we are hoping to have them trained as well. So that even then, as we do the case management for the cases that have been referred to mediation, they understand what the mediation process is. Uh, we do not have, we do not as yet have uh, the formal uh, entrenchment in the rules where the mediation is done by the magistrates and the judges themselves in court. But in so many cases, it happens that uh, there are cases that are before the judges and the magistrates, and they've had to uh, remove the heart of uh, being judicial officers to be able to mediate there and then. Uh, one of the issues that, uh, that is also, uh, we, are, we are looking at uh, why it is very important that we have the training as well, is uh, these are cases that have already been filed in court. And even as we give the bet to the parties that we are sending them to a process that is under the umbrella of the court, we do not want them to see like they are losing out or there's a, they are disadvantaged as compared to the other parties who, have, uh, who are able to have their address in court. So because of that, our directions still allow that parties can file interlocutory applications, uh, which we, we, we cannot deny them from filing, but it requires a judicial officer who understands what the mediation process is to be able to have a conversation with the party so that we don't end up with orders that uh, further uh, draw a rift as, uh, or create so much tension for the, as between the parties that now disadvantages or uh, make difficult for them to go through uh, mediation. Uh, aside from uh, the training of the judges, you have also seen how our courts are like. So it is a, a culture shift for us as well. And we are very happy that now we have the approval of the uh, Judicial Service Commission and the Chief Justice. Uh, as well as uh, 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 really benefited uh, with uh, the leadership of the chief registrar who's a member of the task force, that now going forward, the courts that will be constructed will have uh, mediation uh, suits in them. We, Alex will tell you that we had to go to him when we were starting the, the rollout because we didn't have facilities that would be able to give parties a comfortable feel of uh, having to, uh, to go through their mediations. So currently it's only in Milibani where we have the mediation suits. We try to modify uh, that which we have so that we're able to achieve 
the objective, but uh, to be able to also give parties a comfortable uh, uh, avenue and forum and move away from the setup where now the mediator will have to sit where the judge sits and then uh, expect that we'll be able to have a 90% settlement rate. But uh, from what we've heard from Shanti, I think we are catching up uh, and we, we are looking forward to something much better. The, yeah. there's, uh, the, the issue that was raised about um, uh, the, the settlement agreements. Uh, f currently, as I mentioned, we are, we are working on the, on the rules that will give enforcement to Section 59, which allows for adoption of settlement agreements without necessarily cases being filed in court. But even then, uh, as I mentioned, the, the, there's uh, what Alex mentioned about the national policy and, and uh, the hope that now we'll have practice committees that will be able to give us a lead uh, on how we will merge uh, through the, the, the different ADR mechanisms that we have and how these agreements will be coming in. Because if you notice, even alternative justice system is closely uh, tied up with, uh, with mediation. And uh, there was the issue about uh, what happens when you shake hands and, and you part ways. Uh, what is the settlement agreement that will be brought uh, uh, will be brought to court for us now to enforce? So of course, a little tidbits here and there uh, with loose ends, but we are hoping that uh, now as we move forward with the rules, with legislation, uh, we will get there. I think the best thing that that has happened for us, Shanti, as a country is the conversation that we now have towards alternative dispute resolution being recognized, uh, coming up with mechanisms, even just conversations to, 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 have, uh, to, to let people know that those agreements that you enter into are enforceable, that we are oh, not going important. to send you. Yeah, very important. We will not tell you to, uh, uh, we are not, there's confidentiality, there's, uh, there's no right of appeal where now we don't have fragmented uh, litigations. In, in Kenya, Shanti, we call them litigating in installments. Ah. <laughs> so, uh, uh -huh. but uh, again, going forward, there the, are the conversations about how these settlement agreements will, will come in. Will there be a standard format on the agreements? Uh, will we have, must it be written? What if it is recorded now that we are in the digital uh, era that we are talking about um, e-filing? We are avoiding paper uh, in Milimani, and, uh, and 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 going forward, we are hoping that it, it is it just might not, uh, you know, it, it requires so much inter, uh, intervention and intertwining into the yeah. different and the, the different cases that we have, uh, while at the same time guarding the the confidentiality clause that we have uh, around mediation and the settlement agreements that uh, that come with it. Uh, to on the issue of mentorship, I think Alex mentioned, but it is also of great concern to us, not just for the young, but also for uh, those who are joining in uh, uh, that are, uh, have the added advantage of the years that they have had. Uh, and we are looking into it. I know the accreditation committee has been considering uh, uh, what happens with those who are placed under uh, mentorship, so that we do not have instances where people are paid up, they've been accredited, they're in the register, but they are reading with the status, the, the status indicates um, under mentorship. Uh, we have been very hesitant to take up the issue of mentorship in the courts because of the confidentiality clause that comes in with the matters. Uh, but we are happy that, uh, as mentioned by Alex, there are conversations around how we can carry out this uh, issue of, um, of mentorship without jeopardizing uh, the, the, the benefits of, uh, of, of mediation. Uh, on the payment issue, that is, of course, very thorny. Uh, we've, we've struggled with the issue of sustainability. It's been a journey even for us uh, in the judiciary because when we started Court Annex Mediation in uh, 2016, we, we, we felt like we were already too late uh, considering that the bet that we were giving or what we were relying on was the constitutional pro, uh, the constitution that had been passed in 2010 that required that the judiciary must promote alternative dispute resolution. So it's been a learning process. Uh, I apologize to our mediators who uh, we've, we've run, we are late sometimes with um, making the payments, but uh, the, the issue, uh, if you'll allow me, uh, uh, at a, in, a, in a, just maybe a minute or two, has been the issue of uh, one, sustainability, because we did not, as we started off, uh, we were carrying the, the weight of uh, the payment of mediators because we didn't want to shift 
this burden to litigants who have already paid filing fees. Perhaps they have engaged advocates to be able to bring their matters and then come to court and in a process where even as we have tried to uh, um, paint it nicely like annexed, it is actually mandatory because once they come and there's a directive that has been made for the uh, parties to go through mediation, we do not give them the option of saying no. And uh, because of the culture change and the journey and the introduction that it is something that we were uh, coming in uh, to check out and see what is the replication model that will work for us as a country, we started off with uh, that the payment is shouldered by the judiciary. But there are conversations that we are having around a, a master plan, uh, revisiting the issue of um, sustainability. Uh, but we also want to get there when we are ready that as a country, uh, we, have, uh, we are able now to shoulder risk mediation on our backs uh, very well. And of course, as we had mentioned, it is really, it is not even a payment. It is a honorarium that we give yeah. uh, to the mediators. So please bear with us and please don't look at it more of um, like it is, uh, 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 we, we, we'd be happy that you would consider that the accreditation that we give you is an added advantage to your CV, gives you a leeway to now uh, go out there uh, benefit from the experience that we give you through the quarter uh, next uh, mediation uh, process, but also set it, let it set you up higher on a, on a bigger platform as compared to the mediators that are not accredited for you to be able to now run uh, a separate or a private practice on, uh, on mediation. Uh, uh, though if it will uh, to end nicely, I'm very excited that at least we have now received funds that are enough to pay off uh, the debts that we are, uh, we are owing to the mediators and that uh, going forward, we also have uh, guidelines that will now see these payments being processed from uh, the court stations as compared to that they have to be processed from a central um, unit. So uh, I, th I think if, if, we, if we were to ask in the, in the traditional uh, way, now that we are moving to the digital, I would have requested that we have a hand clap, but uh, since it's not in order, I, 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 I think I'm just happy to share that news uh, with the mediators that we have on board. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Shanti, uh, Rashid, Lee, Alex, and for the conversations. I have Thank noted down the, the feedback that you have given us, including what is it that you're doing um, in, the, in the true Asia. And uh, we are hoping that uh, we will pick up the conversations from here. And Absolutely. mediation is, is collective. I, I'm, I'm imagining if we were able to have this kind of conversations on a regular basis, Absolutely. then yeah, the wheels of justice would move at a speed that uh, I think the bigger than the bet that, uh, that we are giving. So I thank you and I thank you all. Back to you. to you, uh, Madam Atta. And thank you very much, Honorable Kendagor. We appreciate. I'm sure the mediators are very happy. Uh, <laughs> we have uh, someone from the Nyeri Court, uh, Jeff. Uh, I'll just give you a minute to say something before I come back to Shanti for her closing uh, remarks. Uh, Jeff, you can unmute and. You can un unmute, Jeff. Can you, okay, perhaps he can't uh, hear. Um, well, we've had uh, quite a few uh, uh, comments from the people, We're really appreciating, you know, the discussion and the engagement, uh, having learned uh, a lot. And uh, yes, Shanti, we're very grateful. And it's uh, your opportunity to be able to give your closing remarks. Right. Well, I'm going to keep this short. We've had a wonderful session. I've learned as much from you as I, I hope I've been able to share with you. Uh, it was wonderful listening to our young mediators to see the enthusiasm and the hope that is um, available in Kenya about the potential of mediation. Uh, I take from you that the thoughts that you know the, the issue of mentorship in mediation is something we can do globally. I'm happy to hear from Alex that uh, you have a good relationship with the AIAC. Uh, it's a place that I'm very fond of. I was uh, help, I was able to help them with their mediation rules in 2013 and 2017. 
and I should actually acknowledge them publicly as the first institution to say that mediation mediators ought to be paid more respectably in order for mediation to be more respectable in the dispute resolution scene. So uh, if you go to the website of AIAC, you will see some of its recommended uh, fees for the mediators, and it is quite respectable. Um, and I look forward to um, interactions like this um, with uh, all of you. Now that I've learned Karibu, I can teach my friends in Malaysia how to greet you when we meet you again. Uh, Honorable Kendigo, it has been fantastic listening to you as well. I'm, I'm so uh, encouraged by the approach that the Kenyan courts are using. Uh, in fact, giving a space for external mediators, we call them external mediators, to come in and participate and get their pilot flying hours as such. Uh, in Malaysia, that's not been so easy, but we are hopefully that's going to change. Uh, Singapore certainly was a step ahead, allowing for external mediators to get that opportunity. Uh, we certainly think that the value proposition is something that we need to change a little bit because as long as people earn more money doing arbitration, as Alex will share with you, then the focus on that will be on arbitration and adjudication and mediation will remain the, uh, the, the, the lesser looked at uh, dispute resolution mechanism done by people passionate like all of us. Even though we can see the satisfaction in the parties after a well-mediated agreement, uh, nothing beats nothing beats that. Um, having done many, many matters where even when we win, we, we, try, we congratulate ourselves, but at the end of the day, what have we achieved for the parties? And Lily, thank you very much for uh, your contribution as well. Uh, I've, I've learned a lot about the young people of Kenya and all those who are trying to make a difference in mediation. Uh, two thoughts before I close. One is that right now, all of us, Malaysia, Kenya, Singapore, the world, we are at crossroads. As uh, Honorable Kendergo pointed out, we're talking about online mediations. We're talking about online presence, online dispute resolutions. In fact, as uh, Honorable Kendigal was speaking, I wrote down, um, I wrote down recorded agreements. You've given me an idea, Honorable Kendigal. In our amendments to the Mediation Act, we've only talked about written written agreements. It is still of some discomfort for everyone to talk about recorded recorded agreements because people think in terms of. Uh, hacking and other people in interfering with the, uh, with the recorded agreement. But perhaps as we move forward in this 21st century, we need to get to terms with the fact that even in mediation, we need to start moving with the times. And all of us who are mediators need to upskill ourselves to be able to navigate this small screen and be able to help parties find solutions uh, even through online mediations as well as in-person mediations. I look forward to meeting all of you in person one day. If not, we have this wonderful forum and I look forward to more interactions. I'd like to thank you all for this wonderful invitation. I'm very privileged to have been invited and it is really my privilege to meet all of you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, um, Shanti. We appreciate your time and your insight. Thank you to all the panelists, uh, Alex, Honorable Kendagor, uh, Lily and Rashid, and all the uh, different people who have commented and uh, given questions. Uh, we are closing uh, a little late, just a, a bit of uh, housekeeping before we, we, we are just uh, off. Uh, the, the, the next session, the extractive uh, session, will be beginning at uh, 4.15. So once we are done with this, we'll, we'll have a little break and then we resume at uh, 4.15 for the, uh, the session on extractives. So uh, as is uh, normally our uh, tradition, we begin by either singing the national anthem or praying. Uh, speaking out the national anthem as a prayer. We said it out as a prayer for Kenya at the beginning, and uh, we will be having the national anthem, uh, the Malaysian national anthem in conclusion. Wow.
Thank so, you. Um, <laughs> Shanti will, will take us through that. I think you will sing. So would, uh, we would I was singing. Stand. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we can stand in uh, um, honor. Well, of, do you have the music? <laughs> um, let me see. I, the, the, Pankari, right, are you able to uh, play? The YouTube, you, you, you can play it. Do you have it? Or if you don't, then this, I'm happy to. Just a moment. Yeah. This will help you see the translation as well. Thank you so much for this honor, really. Thank you. Sound on. Um, sorry, uh, hello Shanti, you have a last, you have a few words. Oh, yes. Um, thank you so much for the honor of, of sharing my thoughts with you. I really think this is not the end of our conversation, but really the beginning. And as mediators, we are all at the heart of it, peacemakers. And I think we have a lot to contribute to this conversation and this space. I look forward to reading more from you. And, 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 and let's keep this dialogue going. I think we can learn so much from each other. And I look forward to more interactions with all of you. Thank you for this invitation. And I look forward to what Kenya is going to do about mediation in the near future. Thank you. OK. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we appreciate your time. We appreciate your input. And uh, we look forward to uh, being able to uh, uh, we look forward to being able to uh, catch up with you again. Have a good time in your next session. Uh, it's dinner time now in Malaysia, so I shall <laughs> wish you a very good session after this. <laughs> okay. Thank you also, Sarah, and uh, have a good evening, everybody. God bless you. God bless you. you. God bless you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.